Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who still thinks it's funny to call the 49ers the 69ers. He is the captain. Hey ho, it's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling your friends. This week we are drinking Apocalypse Cow by the brilliant folks over at Three Floyds Brewing Company. This is a double IPA that is both pleasing to drink and like many of their creations, it's not normal. ABV, 8.6%. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And this week's Almost Perfect Beer was brought to us by our Almost Perfect listeners right here. First up, a cheers to Heather in Marion, Ohio. And a big cheers, mates, to Robin in Columbus, Ohio. Next up, we have Matthew and his cat, who is a diehard listener, Carlin, <laughs> listening in St. Louis. And a big we like your jib to Stormy in Huntington Beach, California. Next, we have Vicky in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And last but certainly not least, we have Damon all the way up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thanks to everybody for going to TrueCrimeGarage.com and clicking on the donate button and helping out with this week's beer fund. And if you'd like to snuggle, snuggle up with the captain and the colonel, we have new Less Snuggle sweaters. They're on sale right now. They will sell out soon, so get them while they last at TrueCrimeGarage.com, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Yesterday, we discussed that investigators determined that Sharice Bingham's death was in fact a homicide, and they were investigating it as such. And in talking with her husband, Eugene Bingham, they quickly learned that his story was just not adding up. And then there is this. Police found out about a possible affair from an anonymous call that came in early in the investigation. The caller referenced a 14-year relationship Eugene was having with another woman. Keith Walker, Sharice's older brother, who has worked very hard to keep his sister's unsolved murder in the public eye, tells us that about a year before she died, Sharice discovered that Eugene had purchased a duplex in town and was renting it out. The property manager was listed as a woman whom Eugene met when both of them worked at UPS. Her job there was in the HR department, but she moved on to the real estate business. All right, hold on. So he's their relationship is kind of strange, but they're going to stay married. Eugene lives in the basement. Bo Peep lives in the basement. So their marriage isn't great. And then she finds out a year before she's murdered, he purchased a property, a duplex. So he purchased this and she didn't even know about it. That's that's right. According to her brother, that's the information we have. All right. This guy is, uh, he's, he's not just lying to the cops. He's lying about everything. This woman and Eugene are having an affair. Now, after Sharice's death, her family found out that this woman and Eugene owned another house together. This is where this woman lived. Keith Walker believes that Sharice never knew about this other house, but she did know about the girlfriend. We aren't going to name Eugene's girlfriend here, but it's now his wife. And you can find that information online and in some of the papers. We will simply refer to her as the girlfriend. Now, in any event, the side piece. Sharice found out about this affair and was upset enough to pawn her wedding ring, according to her family. Why she didn't leave Eugene, we don't, we don't know. Perhaps she was making plans to do just that. Right. But according to Eugene, he says things were still good with him and his wife. Initially, Eugene, in talking to investigators, denied the affair. But then he told Detective Norvell that he had a fling that had ended four years earlier after Sharice found out about it. 
But police continued to press Eugene about who this other woman was. And eventually Eugene admitted that it wasn't just a fling, that he continued to see this woman and the relationship never ended. He did give police her name and her phone number. Now back to the phone records that we discussed yesterday. Yeah, the phone number is 1-800-SHIT-PAG. From December 3rd to December 11th, this is only eight days, the eight days leading up to the murder, Eugene called his girlfriend 38 times. That's with a three followed by an eight, 38 times. What did he call her? She called Eugene 72 times. Jesus. On the day after the shooting... The girlfriend called Eugene nine times. Then communication abruptly stopped with only one call between the two from December 14th, 2012 to January 27th, 2013. That seems incredibly strange to have both of those behaviors going on in such a short time period. Yeah, yeah. Why didn't Eugene just divorce Sharice if he's already having this other relationship? Well, the number one possible answer here, Captain? Money. He, right, right. He's But he's also acquiring wealth or properties without her knowing. So the state police, the Indiana State Police, they discovered that Sharice had multiple life insurance policies and that Eugene was the beneficiary. According to court documents, Eugene had two life insurance policies on his wife. It's not clear whether he was the one that purchased these policies or if, in fact, Sharice was the one that purchased the policies. But one of the policies was for Mm $200,000, and the other was for $250,000. And Sharice had a policy at work through her work for a total of $410,000. So I'm going to do my public school math for everybody on display for all to hear and see and witness the brilliance. That's $860,000 in total. That's a ton of money for someone who is really just sitting around drinking and smoking. Mm -hmm. That is, as the Colonel says, a whole lot of rolling papers. <laughs> That's a lot, not a whole, whole lot of zigzags. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Eugene, when Sharice died, was unemployed. Wait, I want to, I want to be clear about this. So she had a policy through her work. Correct. I'm going to assume That's that. That's pretty standard stuff. Right, but I'm going to assume that she set that up. She seemed like a very go-getter, a responsible person. And so I'm going to say that she set that, those up. There was two pieces of property purchased without her knowledge. Correct. I'm going to go ahead and say that the other two policies, the one for 200,000, the one, and then there was another for 250,000, right? Correct. I'm going to say that those, my gut is telling me Eugene bought those and that possibly she didn't know anything about it because you'd think that the policy through uh, her work would suffice enough. I think you're spot on for a couple of reasons. Not only do we see another uh, acts of behavior where he's doing things behind her back, but also purchasing things, purchasing property. Look, most people do not over insure themselves as, as good as the insurance sales man or woman is. Most people do not over insure themselves. We're talking. Sharice does not have any children. Yes, her and her husband have a home together, but you're not going to set up a situation where you're paying money out of pocket to hold these policies that's going to allow this man to, quote unquote, hit the lottery when something happens to you. So you would insure yourself just enough to take care of that person, take care of the properties, any outstanding bills, things like that. But with no kids, this seems like... A huge amount. This this is over insured. So I agree with you, Captain. I think it looks like right. to me that Eugene mm. may have been secretly holding these additional policies because the one from her work is the largest. That's four hundred ten thousand dollars. That's that's a significant amount. That takes care of everything and ties up all loose ends should something happen to right. her. Right, and takes care of you and your basement and and the house that's attached to it. 
Yeah. But now when you have two other properties with, you know, your, your side piece, I think they call them side pieces because they're side pieces of shit. But, uh, but now you have two properties with your side piece. Now we have two more policies that cover those. It's just, and I, I would like to know when the other two policies were, were bought. When confronted with this information, obviously police and detectives are going to inform Eugene, if he can't figure it out for himself, that motive, motive for murder here could, in fact, be these three insurance policies. It's money, man. They're going to point out to him, look, you are unemployed at the time that she died. Mm -hmm. Now, for his part, Eugene said that he had bought into a few businesses that didn't take off. They hadn't taken off yet for whatever reason that he did own that rental property that did generate some income. So he, they're, they're making different arguments. The investigators making the argument that money was a motivating factor. And he's trying to negate all that by saying, look, I, I had some income with this rental property and I had some businesses that just hadn't taken off yet. Eugene did agree to take a polygraph test and did so on January 9th, 2013. Before the test was initiated, detectives asked Eugene what he believed happened to his wife. He said he was mulling this over for quite some times and actually thinking of several different scenarios. He says one possibility, Sharice had the gun in her pocket, the safety was off, and one of the dogs jumped up and discharging the weapon. But as we know, this just does not work due to the bullet holes in her clothing that we have already discussed. Right. Eugene also suggested that Sharice could have slipped and fallen and accidentally shot herself then. Again, the evidence says not. When pressed, Eugene said that all he knew for sure was that Sharice did not harm herself on purpose and that he had nothing to do with it. He just wanted the whole thing to be over, is what he told the investigators. This was a nightmare for him as well, as he states he really missed Sharice. But then Eugene may have slipped up in his statement to investigators. Mm -hmm. He said that he learned from the coroner that the projectile, and I, this is a quote, this is a direct quote, quote, projectile that had killed his wife had been recovered end quote. He said he assumed that law enforcement had matched it to the gun found at the scene. But on January 9th, when Eugene made this statement, police had not yet gathered the proof showing that the ballistics were in fact a match. In other words, Eugene knew that the bullet came from Sharice's gun before investigators did. <laughs> Eugene also made another interesting statement. Got him. When asked, quote, what should happen to a person that kills his wife, end quote, Eugene responded, they should go to jail just like the person that did it, end quote. He went on to say that if you plotted with someone, then you should go to jail along with the person who did it. So it looks like Eugene thought that police were asking him about a conspiracy about a conspiracy to commit murder, the murder of his wife. Right. Could that in fact be a clue as to what actually happened and what actually went down? Eugene continued to ramble wondering what would have happened if he had accompanied his wife on her walk. He said, I'd probably be in jail. According to what he says he's seen on TV, the husband is always the first suspect in response to questioning. He said that there are three reasons he could think of that might cause someone to kill their spouse money. They fall out of love or they find out their spouse has done something bad. Yeah. But in, in fairness, okay. You're ask a question, whatever he gives you as an answer that makes him look guilty. Right. So, I mean, in, in all fairness to, to him, because if you ask me right now uh, uh, that same question, my answers are going to be similar. That doesn't mean I had anything to do with the death of uh, Cerise. So, 
Right. And not only that, one, one, technique that detectives very often use now keep in mind i'm summarizing a lot of this information but hold on i I do want to applaud you because you did (sighs) the colonel pulled a keith morris yeah where where you set it up you know and then he then he answered it could be money well i I spend every night watching on the tv Mm -hmm. learning watching and learning growing (laughs) <laughs> trying to become a better person. Yeah. So, um, but one technique that detectives will very often use is they'll throw out a question there for you. They'll let you answer it. And then they just kind of sit there in hopes that you'll continue to talk. And some people will do this in a nervous fashion and others will just do it because there's an awkward silence. And it sounds to me like that's what's going on here, that they just throw out a couple of questions that may have even started with some softball questions, and he gives them an answer and then continues to ramble on, ramble on. And in, in a way, you know, the old the old saying, if you, if you find yourself in a grave, stop digging, mm-hmm. you know. So now the polygraph test itself, and there are some people out there right now that are booing, Boo. boo! Here they go talking about polygraph again. We understand Poo-poo they're not. On your boo. They're of no use in the court of law, but obviously the investigators are still using them. We are still going to talk about them. So the polygraph itself only presented Eugene with three questions: one, two, three questions. The first being, "Did you shoot Sharice?" The second, "Are you the one who shot Sharice?" And the third, "Do you know?" for sure, who shot Sharice. Eugene answered no to all three questions. The examiner scored the exam. He determined that it was inconclusive, but further indicated that it was very close to a failure. A second examiner Mm -hmm. scored the exam and also determined that it was, quote, at or near failure. Furthermore, according to an affidavit, An additional check was done with an electronic scoring system that is used only as a reference. And that scoring system scored these tests as a failure. So the official results of the poly was inconclusive. But Detective Norvell considers Eugene to have failed the polygraph. Okay, I'm trying to follow you here. It's um, tough. This this part of this story is is very confusing. So they give one test, but they have two different individuals score that test, and then they then they have a computer basically score the test as well. Mm-hmm. Very <laughs> well. See, now that, all I'm thinking about is Keith Morrison. That <laughs> is why, in fact, that these polygraph tests are not of any use in the court of law because. Yeah. They, you know, look, the the slang term for them are lie detector test. The test does not detect lying at all. Right. It detects your reaction to the question and your behavior uh, at the time that you are providing an answer. Mm-hmm. So what that means is it's not a situation where it was, did you have McDonald's for breakfast today? And I say, yes. And then the thing goes, eh, which means I'm lying. Yes. No, it just records my my reaction to the question and to the answer that I'm providing, and then somebody has to come in and view it with their own eyes and ex- you know review the exam and score it. Like, so it's open to interpretation. Right. So, so the detectives come into the room and they ask the colonel, "Did you have McDonald's breakfast this morning? Was he telling the truth?" We will never know. We may never know. I I plead the fifth. I I need to work on my Keith Morrison. So Eugene agreed to a second polygraph examination. This was going to take place on January 22nd. Before the exam, he answered some questions about his affair. He said that he, the woman started off as his business partner, but one thing led to another And then it turned into something else. He did say that Sharice did in fact find out about the affair, but he was never fully honest with Sharice. 
Eugene felt sure that Sharice Wait, had died on. not knowing that he was continuing to see this woman. That's probably maybe the most truthful thing that he's ever said is when he was like, I wasn't honest with her. Like, right. I, that's probably the most honest thing that this guy could say. I'm a lying shit princess. But it also, in a sense, that's him trying to, to look, when when they say money was a motivating factor in her murder, he's saying, well, I had income. It's not just so so clean and simple that I was unemployed. I had income coming in. And then when suggesting that the affair would be motive for her murder, he's saying she found out about it. I told I admitted to it, but I wasn't fully honest with her. And at the time of her death, she died not knowing that I was continuing to see this woman. Right, so, right, right. So and, if she doesn't know at the time of her death, then like, it may not be a motivating factor for the murder is what he's trying to say. Right. Let's start with the idea. Again, we don't know who bought the policies, but I think the policies is motive for murder. I don't care if he even had a job. It's motive for murder. The fact that you're having right, an right, affair right. or had an affair, had one, or is having one, that is motive. That means that you didn't like your current situation, and so you you decided to run out on your wife, right? So also th- sounds th- like he doesn't have enough things, enough hobbies to fill his day with because he's not busy working. So right, but then so so we have that, but then we also have I think just the fact that he is buying properties and having almost a double life is is motive for murder because when she finds out about the one piece of property she didn't find out about the other piece of property so is he trying to hide that from her and then again it with let's go back to the stepping out on your wife okay she knows that you had an affair but she doesn't know it's continuing maybe she knew it was continuing but she didn't give a rat's ass because you're lazy piece of shit ass lives in the basement right and she's planning on leaving you anyways she's just not telling you that because why the hell would she have to tell you that when you've been stepping out on her right so i think there's a lot of motives here uh but the issue that i'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is i think these motives as as damning as they are pointing the finger to Eugene, it really makes me start questioning the side piece because all those benefits would benefit her as well. Yeah. So the, when we, when we talk about motive though, as well, let's for, for anything, one thing that I see here, the, the ownership of two properties with this woman that shows a motive that he was not intending at any time to to leave that other relationship. Right. This shows a motive that he intends to further that relationship and to build that relationship. And again, well, one he has thing, more to lose. He has more property right, and, to lose and, and and possible income to lose if he if he loses that relationship. And one and one thing that's not discussed as a possible motive is Maybe she was, maybe Sharice was in fact planning on leaving him and maybe she expressed that to him at some point. Right. So we, we were going down the path of the polygraphs, the not lie detectors, but the second polygraph test that he agrees to. Now this took place on January 22nd. Again, in the second poly, there were only three questions asked of Eugene. One, did you shoot Sharice? Two, are you the one who shot Sharice? And three, did you participate in the shooting of Sharice? Again, the results of this exam were inconclusive and close to failure. Detective Norvell tells us that he initially asked Eugene to submit to a polygraph exam so he could rule the husband out as a suspect. I think that's pretty interesting to hear that from one of the detectives on the case. He's not saying that we gave him this polygraph test because we believed he was the number one guy because he was the prime suspect. 
we simply asked him to to submit to the polygraph because we wanted to clear him and move on from the husband being a suspect and to look into different areas. Mm-hmm. So for anyone out there that's going, well, they got tunnel vision and they set their sights on Eugene and never, never let go, left it in the lock position. I think this statement here to me is, is quite telling that that in fact was not the situation. They didn't have tunnel vision. They weren't locked and loaded on Eugene. And in fact, when the results of the polygraph come back and it's found to be inconclusive, close to failure, this actually changing the mindset and drastically changing and shifting the focus of the detectives working the case. And it shifted that focus to Eugene. Welcome back, my lovely, lovely friends. Welcome to the garage. Smells good. Oh, God. Gross. (laughs) Smells good in the garage. I lit some candles. Clean out your face. Uh, Hey, the weather keeps changing, so it goes from super cold to not so bad. I'm a little clogged up. And we're in a garage, so... um, Eugene's girlfriend took that polygraph test that we were talking about. She took this on February 8th, 2013. And the questions again here are just three questions. First being, did you shoot that woman? The second, are you the one who shot that woman? And third, did you participate in the shooting of that woman? Interesting to see the contrast between the two polygraphs even though they are just three questions long. Right. When you're questioning the husband, you state the victim's name. And when testing the girlfriend, you refer to Sharice as that woman. Find that to be interesting. I don't know what the the strategy is there. Now, the girlfriend did answer no to all three questions. She was scored as a failure. She left the exam and retained an attorney. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, man. We both like lie detector tests, but we also tell people if I was charged with a crime and then it doesn't matter if I was innocent or not, if they said, well, let, let's give you a lie detector. There's, there's no, it's like throwing the f- football and, and, um, uh, Two bad things can happen or something like that. What's well, that that's saying? what Woody Hayes used to say, that when you throw the football, only two, only three things can happen and two of them are bad, meaning it would be intercepted or an incomplete pass. And then the one good being that you complete the pass and it, and it you know, right. but further the ball sa- down the field. But that's same with a polygraph. The good thing is, is that you pass it. The bad thing is you fail. But the other bad thing is it's inconclusive. Yeah, and I mean, we've said this before. You really have nothing to gain by by passing it. Right. Right? Like, there's there's really nothing for you to gain because if you do pass the polygraph and, and the investigators still have evidence and still believe you to be guilty, they're just going to say, well, that doesn't matter. We can't use it in court anyway. Right. It, it's really just a tool. And I think it's it's a tool really to apply pressure to the person that you need, that you want to crack, to crack and give a confession or to crack and give an incriminating statement. I think that the only way that you would, let's say you are innocent and you know yourself to be innocent. The only way that you would agree to a polygraph, I have seen scenarios where Someone says, I will do a polygraph exam, but my attorney is going to hire the person giving the exam and we're going to do the test, conduct the test at my attorney's office. You know, they really play it like home court advantage right. type situation. So it's it's really, really a tricky thing. And it's really a tricky thing in this particular case because we stated this at the beginning of yesterday's show. This case seems to me to not be solved due to a lack of 
effort or know-how. It seems that this case is just unsolved because of a lack of evidence. And police, by this point in our story, they believe that Eugene Bingham was in some way responsible for his wife's death. However, the Walker family began to suspect Eugene's involvement in Sharice's death from the beginning, according to Deborah McMurray. That's what she told True Crime Daily. And to this day, they still do. They still believe that he is involved in some way in Sharice's death. And here's why. This is the circumstantial evidence. The gun and its pouch were in two different locations, contrary to Sharice's habit, leading the family to believe that the gun was used to kill Sharice that it had not gone with her on her walk. Only Eugene's DNA was on the gun, although there were no usable prints. Mm -hmm. Another thing that they point to, Eugene didn't have much of an alibi for that night. Eugene was having a long-term affair. The dogs, they say, her family says, likely knew the attacker. Cell phone evidence put Eugene Bingham in the area at the time of the murder. Eugene and his girlfriend both failed or close to failed polygraph examinations. And finally, they point to the fact that Sharice had three life insurance policies totaling $860,000 and rotten Bo Peep Eugene was the beneficiary of of those policies. Yeah. Shit princess. Mm -hmm. So could all of this circumstantial evidence lead to an arrest? Well, after detectives worked the case for 16 months, prosecutors felt that there was in fact enough evidence to proceed against Eugene. A Marion County grand jury was convened in March of 2014. The girlfriend testified before the panel, but did not shed any more light on what actually happened right because she can't incriminate herself on july 16th 2014 this is nearly two years after sharice was killed an affidavit for probable cause was filed in marion county indiana seeking the arrest of eugene bingham he was arrested on july 28th and charged with murder the trial was set for september 2015 and Keith Walker, representing his sister's estate, filed a wrongful death action against Eugene Bingham. About six weeks before the trial, the Walker family was hit with some devastating news. Marion County prosecutors decided to drop the charges against Eugene. Indiana State Police Detective Rich Myers, who worked the Bingham case, said, quote, We know we charged the right person, but we just need that little bit more of information, end quote. Right. Eugene was free to go. So what happened to plunge the DA's case? The short answer is the cell phone tower evidence fell apart. Ping, 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 ping. Much like when I tried to read it for you <laughs> on the show. <laughs> so according to her brother, to Sharice's brother, Keith Walker, The prosecuting attorney and the detectives decided that there was not enough evidence to convict Eugene, given that they could not get Sprint, the cell service provider, to testify in court that Eugene's phone was at the murder scene. All right. And but in layman's terms, what happened, right? Right. They, 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 They do the they get the information from Sprint at some point and that puts him in the area. Mm-hmm. And they start going, okay, well, now his alibi is not making any sense. Now his story is falling apart. But his story is falling apart because they have that information. And then when they charge him and they're about to go to trial, it's not even that Sprint is telling them that, hey, look, um, that information we gave you, we're not saying it's right or wrong, but we don't think it's accurate. Correct. What what was reported on Investigation Discovery, they reported that the cell phone company said their data was flawed and that they were no longer confident their records could be relied upon to place Eugene at the scene. Now, Detective Norvell explained that the cell phone company 
could not confirm the location accuracy of the call from the chiropractor. Remember, that's the call that went to Eugene's voicemail. Around 7.30, 7.40. Yeah, as, as they could for an answered call. Okay, so what he's saying he that they were told by the cell phone provider was because that phone call went to voicemail, the provider is saying that information is less accurate than had Eugene answered the call. That right. that ping would be more accurate. Right. And because they're not willing to testify in court at his trial, the judge isn't going to let that evidence stand if you don't have an expert there to back it up. Right. Keep going. So this, again, is in relation to the 7.41 p.m. call uh, regarding where where the pings were coming in from the cell phone towers. This would have put Eugene's phone by the river at that time rather than at home like he said he was, but the provider saying, we can't 100% back that up. The other thing too, Captain, is you and I know from other cases that this cell phone tower pinging evidence really isn't or doesn't seem to be super reliable in in most cases. Right. I wish they checked, and I don't know if they did, uh, but uh, the girlfriend, the side pieces, cell phone, to check that locations and see uh, where where her whereabouts were. Because to me, one of the things that Eugene, when he says, you know, when they ask him, you know, what should happen to a, a husband that that kills his wife and he starts going, well, they should go to jail just like the person that did it. Like, again, it's almost like he's making up this narrative of, yeah, okay, I sh- if if my girlfriend gets caught for the murder, I should go to jail too. And so I'd really like to know where her whereabouts are. Or whoever are. he hired to kill her. Right. But I'd like to know where her whereabouts are because to me it seems like again she has just as many motives as him and and now they're married so not, not, now they're a lifelong team and it's like i'd like to know where she was at yeah i mean and the other thing too is you really wonder if that 741 call that goes to his voicemail is that really the slip up? Because in every situation, a, a criminal or a, a, a team of criminals makes a mistake. They just do. There are no such thing as perfect crimes. It's just detectives do not detect what the mistake is and can't can't really exploit that mistake to their advantage. So you wonder if that 741 p.m. call, if that was the slip up. Because remember, he, Eugene, tells law enforcement that his wife was there at their home at the start of the basketball game, which is starting around that same 741 time frame yeah. within minutes of that. And you wonder if, if she, look, if he was in a different place and trying to make up an alibi and somebody else is out doing the dirty deed but does not reach out to him until 741 in his P brain. He's saying, I only need to, uh, I need to account for my alibi around this time of 741, which according to the investigators timeline means nothing. She had been killed and been found and police responded an hour and 11 minutes earlier than that. Right. So it, it's, it's all very tricky here. Unfortunately, What takes place is the authorities have to explain to Sharice's family that because of double jeopardy, it is best for them to drop the charges for now and to strive to obtain more evidence to build an ironclad case against Eugene Bingham. Nine years later, the family is still waiting. The wrongful death suit was essentially settled. The life insurance company was forced to pay on the policies on Sharice's once once the charges were dismissed against Eugene. They right. had to pay him 
for those policies. Well, now he can take that money and hire better a better lawyer. Well, since Keith was suing on his sister's behalf to collect the funds instead, the insurance company paid the proceeds into the court, and then the court held them until the dispute between Keith and Eugene could be resolved via mandated arbitration. Keith, on behalf of Sharice's estate, felt that he had no choice but to settle for $75,000. Eugene Bingham collected the rest, and he then married his longtime girlfriend. They still own the house where Sharice and Eugene lived as husband and wife. Police still consider Eugene the or the suspect in this open and unsolved murder. As we've seen from all the things we've discussed, it certainly would have been possible for Eugene to be the shooter and to have acted alone. But there are also some other possibilities. Eugene seemed to be addressing the detective's questions from the perspective of a conspirator. Right. When asked what should happen to the murderer, he responds that if someone plotted with someone to kill someone else, they should be prosecuted equally. He volunteered the conspiracy angle. Eugene could have hired someone to kill his wife. This would likely have had to involve possibly burner phones and Eugene giving Sharice's gun to the shooter in advance. The shooter would have followed Sharice to the trail. Right. Remember we said her family says she thought she was being followed ban the blue blazer. Right. And could have pretended to be a pedestrian or even a cyclist and shot Sharice from a close range before the dogs would have alerted to any danger. If it happened this way, though, one would think that Eugene would come up with come up with a better alibi than I fell asleep on the couch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing that is strange, regardless of how this went down or who was responsible, according to Detective Norvell, no witnesses ever have come forward to say that they heard a gunshot. This is in the middle of a city, not in a remote area. Mm-hmm. And it's surprising since when detectives arrived on the scene, there were more than a couple of bystanders in the area. Was the shooter lucky? You know, we, we've talked about that, and I hate to say it that way, but we've talked about it in so many other cases. Well, say it in your Keith Morrison voice, and everybody will like it better. Sometimes these scumbags just get lucky. And whatever went down that night, might that might just be part of it. Yeah. Or did... The shooter, did he or she follow Sharice and make sure that no one else was around before making their move? That's a possibility as well. Yeah. Okay. So weirdly, though, I think uh, Eugene got lucky because I actually think he was at home. I think that was the plan and he was at home. And then the cell phone ping technology was actually wrong because I don't know necessarily if he would have been the one to try to pull this off unless his girlfriend was at his house. I I just think it's, you know, you take her polygraph test. Look, we know he's a known liar, but when you look at her polygraph test, to me, she failed the test and, and yeah. that, that, that puts her involved somehow. Now, again, we, we're not stating her name. She doesn't have about- to be guilty of anything other than knowledge, though, to fail that test. Right. Right? Meaning meaning she didn't have to kill Sharice or participate in the actual crime itself other than Eugene or whoever is responsible may have told her what happened prior to that test. Because one of yeah. one of those questions is simply, do you know... What happened to that woman? Do you know who shot that woman? And she could be lying about that. Right. But if you shot her, you're a piece of shit. If you knew Eugene shot her, you're a piece of shit. You know what I mean? If you know somebody else did it. Oh yeah, nobody's you're arguing a piece of shit. nobody's arguing that. I'm just clearing up that because she didn't pass the polygraph doesn't mean that she was the the trigger man. Right. That she was the shooter. But she has knowledge. And that's 
pathetic. You're living with this man and you have knowledge that he either. And again, to me, if you have knowledge of it and you're not going to the police and then on top of that, you're going to marry this guy. (laughs) It's like you're even a bigger piece of shit than I thought you were. Well, you're a freaking moron too because look, you're a piece of shit for knowing and not going to the police. You're a moron for marrying a guy that you know did something terrible or was involved in something as heinous as a murder. Yeah, and a lot of times they'll say, don't get involved. That you doesn't know. seem like a good person to shack up with. Right. Because you're, you you would be the next in line for what happened to Sharice. Right, that's like when two married couples are having an affair and then the people that are having an affair get married and then they're jealous all the time because they know that th- what the person's capable of. Well, so n- now that you know he's capable of you know, one, not having a job and sponging off his significant other, uh, living in the basement, smoking his uh, zigzags. Uh, you know, he's capable of that. You know, he's also capable of lying for 14 years and having this affair. You know, he's capable of buying property behind your back. And now you know that he's capable of murder or hiring somebody for murder, conspiracy for murder. So what's, where's your self worth? You idiot, you know, so it's ridiculous. And, and, and I hope she hears this and goes, you know what? Maybe, maybe I could be in danger one day and I should go to the police and say, Hey, this is what I know because with the evidence they have and, and take away the ping, ping, ping evidence with the evidence they have and her confession. Yeah. Maybe you go to jail for a little bit, but. They're going to, they'll make a deal with you and then he'll go to way, he'll go away for a really long time, which will protect you. I don't think this woman who would be in her late fifties, I'm guessing based off of what we have in front of us, uh, I don't believe that, that now she would grow a brain after all of <laughs> these years of walking around on this planet, bumping into walls and such, but I think here, and this is this is something that is not going to help the case at all, but this is where my questions lie, is with the pouch, the gun pouch, the, the, the one that was made specifically to house the gun that killed Sharice, Sharice's gun. Yeah. I feel that it's very interesting for two reasons that those two things were separated. I see no reason why they should have been separated other than somebody was conspiring against Sharice for the sake of murder or plotting by themselves her murder. Right. And I think what's interesting, interesting thing here is that Eugene is the one who reported it. Now, I know we've said a lot of bad things about Eugene and I've called him a lot of different names, but at least in this situation, he was smart enough to identify and to recognize if they find these two items separately and away from one another, I now have to if I don't want to have to be the one to explain that away, I might as well be the one to report it to detectives that I found it at our home. Yeah, I agree. And where I'm going with this is is two situations, okay? If Eugene was plotting, was was conspiring with somebody else to shoot and kill Sharice on the trail or or at some location, if she was being followed, maybe this location that night was not planned. It was just whenever you can pull it off, do it. But the reason for that pouch and that gun to be in separate locations I, I'm a gun owner. I keep my guns in cases and and things of that nature. I have areas where I keep them. If I see that case, my assumption is because my gun is always in there, unless I'm using it, the gun is in there. Meaning Sharice could, could see potentially see that pouch at her home and believe that her gun was in that pouch without checking it. Right. Meaning he could have had to give that gun to the other person so that when opportunity comes a knocking, his cons- his conspirator has the weapon on their person and can pull the trigger then and there. Right. And but, leave the gun with Sharice. Right. But he also had a matching gun, so he could have just taken her little 
gun purse and then put his gun in there, you know, as a decoy. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And then to further that thought, then the other thing is if in fact Eugene was the trigger man, maybe when he dumped the gun next to Sharice and he took off those winter gloves that were found next to her body, so his prints or somebody else's prints wouldn't be on the gun and dropped them next to her body as well. Maybe he forgot to dump the pouch there as well. And, or maybe he forgot to bring it with him that night and then later decided, well, I got to account for this. And rather than be the one that has to explain it away, maybe if I just report it, they will not consider this to be part of, of, of the large amount of circumstantial evidence that points to Eugene in closing the Sharice Walker Bingham murder is now a cold case. The Walker family continues to hold vigils and conduct Facebook campaigns to help bring attention to the case. Everyone remains hopeful that someone will come forward and do the right thing. We would like to thank detective Norvell and the Indiana state police for all of their hard work on this case and thank them again for taking time out of their very busy schedules to answer our questions. We wish the Walker family nothing but the best and would like to remind everyone that if you have any information at all to please call the Indiana state police at 1-800-453-4756. This week we have a little recommended listening for everybody out there. Make Listen sure you up, people. Th that's right. I just heard the captain Listen. in my headphones. Now I'm listening. Now listen up. <laughs> this week we are telling you. We are telling only the hardcore garage listeners. Yeah, you other sissies. Forget about it. Stop you. listening. Right. Don't listen. Hardcore garage listeners. Here's what we want you to do. Go check out our other show off the record. You will love it. This is for you. This is your official invite to join us in the garage for off the record. Yeah, check we, it out. Go yeah. to, go to our website, mm -hmm. right? That's how they, and click on off the record. And you're going to get to, I believe you can listen for free for a while, like, right? A free trial. Yeah. For a whole month. And we talk about case updates. We talk about other cases that maybe aren't big enough to cover in a whole hour. And then we also talk about some goofy stuff. We talk uh, about rock and roll. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> we talk so, about rocking and rolling. Yeah. So if you are a hardcore garage listener, this is your official invite. Check out the other show, Off the Record. Yeah. Check out Off the Record. Go to truecrimegarage.com and click on Off the Record. And until next week. Be good, be kind, and don't litter.